Good morning, all. I'm not used to leading off, so it's kind of different this morning, but I'm going to do our Mother's Day presentation. And while I'm doing this, I have some children that are going to pass out some goodies to the women, thanks to Taylor. I appreciate her doing that for me. But today is Mother's Day, and it's a special day for all of us. I'm going to tell you, I'm a mother. I'm also a grandmother. It was much easier being a grandmother. <laughs> Let me tell you. But you have to realize that motherhood's a gift from God. Motherhood is beautiful. He instituted it. Can everybody be a mother? No. Maybe not in a biological way. Does that make you less of a person if you can't be a mother? No. That might not be God's plan for you. But don't allow it to make you bitter. And don't encourage those that are bitter about it to wallow in that hurt and bitterness. Motherhood is never easy. It's amazing and miraculous and stressful. And sometimes all at the same time. Being a mother this past year forced many to rethink your careers, your schedules, your dependence on one another to make all at work. While the pandemic's effect upon the family and the workplace is still being written, those who gave birth over the long months of the pandemic already know they faced new challenges. They, that is, as they proceeded with their pregnancies, as they brought babies to home, as they tried to show them that the world was wide and beautiful and full of people who loved them but could not touch them. For them, it has resulted in months of isolation and perseverance. For the, them, this Mother's Day brings a special kind of celebration. But just remember, mothers, you're not alone. What is the most challenging thing in the world? Many have said it's being a mother. It's also been considered a job. But while it's not a job in the strict sense of the word, it is nevertheless a tough endeavor. Mother's, motherhood is a blessing, but sometimes it can be a lovely one too, and lonely. For some, motherhood is a time of spiritual dryness, as they often feel depleted to carve out time to be alone with God. However, motherhood can be a time of reliance on God as the struggle becomes overwhelming and real. But remember, you are not alone. God has, hears your cries in your heart. I don't have a computer, can you tell? <laughs> and the silence of night is even together with your children's cries. Isaiah 66, 13 says, As one whom his mother comforted, so will I comfort you. Motherhood is a time of many experiences. Unexpected, joy, surprise, advocate, strong, hope, worry, positive, and sometimes loss, but God is there through it all. Melissa, you're up. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. Well, well, there may not be much sunshine out there, but if we have the Lord in our hearts, we have sunshine in our soul. Let's all stand together and start our celebration in song this morning. There is sunshine in my soul today. Shine in my 
it. Well, good morning. morning. All right, we're going to. It is. It is not the best weather outside, but we can make the weather bright in here. Let's try that again. Good morning. There we go. There we go. Um, Thank you all for everybody joining us today. First, I want to say happy Mother's Day to all the women in the room, uh, to all the ladies out there. This is not just a day to celebrate our biological mothers, uh, but to celebrate our adopted mothers, our women, all the ladies in the house. Uh, We celebrate you, and we are so thankful for the many acts of service that you do and just for being you. So we're just thankful for you today. Uh, I want to wish a significant happy Mother's Day to each and every one of you. Uh, A few thank yous that I want to mention. One, Thank you to Paula uh, for her flexibility, threw her on the spot there, starting it off. Uh, Thank you to Taylor and team for bringing the gifts in. We want to honor our mothers, uh, just show you a a small act of kindness today. Um, And to all the men in the room, um, as you go out and fight the restaurant crowd, I'll get you out on time to go do that. Remember where your wives like to eat, Um, so please, please take care of them today. Um, With that, a few announcements. No evening service tonight. Take the time to celebrate Uh, The women in your life, uh, some of you may have plans tonight, um, but no evening service tonight. We'll pick that back up next Sunday evening, so that means there will be no youth, no choir practice. Coming into next week, uh, we will have Wednesday evening service. That'll be at 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday, and then we'll have our regular um, evening service next Sunday night as well. Choir practice next Sunday or... Okay, no more choir practice for a while, um, so no evening service, as I said, uh, tonight, but we'll have that Wednesday and next, uh, next Sunday, um, too. Quick update, uh, I just want to do another huge thank you for yesterday, and I don't know if, Melissa, if you want to say anything on behalf of that, but um, extremely uh, excited for all that happened yesterday, so thankful for Melissa and team and uh, the men in the kitchen crew, uh, Don leading that out as well. Uh, here we had 78 women come out yesterday. Yeah, at least uh, 78 women come out for our women's uh, ladies' luncheon, so thank you to all who attended. Thank you to all the women that came out to that. I hear it was a wonderful time, um, and we're just so thankful for our men that helped uh, prepare that too, Uh, but that was another way to celebrate um, our women, so just thank you for that. Um, A few upcoming announcements, so exciting things going on here at the church. Uh, This week, there was four events that happened. Uh, This upcoming uh, month, we have a lot going on, so a few things that I want to highlight Uh, Next Sunday morning, so we finish Esther today, so we're going to conclude Esther. I'm excited to to finish Esther. I've really enjoyed this book um, and bringing it full circle. Uh, Next week, our once-a-year appearance, Don Adamson will be here. Um, With that, I'll be here as well. We'll have food following service, so uh, not a potluck style. We're going to have pizza. We'll have pizza brought in um, for us. We'll have that immediately following service at around 1145 is when we'll eat, Uh, so uh, please be with us next week as Don comes and shares uh, through some of the uh, the trials and things that have been going on in Haiti. We're just excited for him to share with us what that looks like and the path forward for our church and our partnership. So he'll be here next week um, as well, so we're excited about that. Um, and then a few other upcoming events. We'll really start talking about trivia night next week. Uh, but as a reminder, the categories are in the back. If you would like to uh, see a category out there that's no guarantee, I talked to Jackie this week um, and, and Gary. They're going to be emceeing. I'll give them all 10 of the categories that I want, and if any of those align with yours, then you're just in luck. So, uh, no, they're excited about it. Always excited to have Trivia Night, one of my favorite events. But with this year, um, that will be our major Haiti event. So we did not have the Valentine's uh, Day dinner that we usually have. So this will be our big event. So hopefully everybody can come out and be with us, even if you don't like trivia. Um, you'll like trivia probably after this, but there will be opportunities for you to, uh, to serve and a few cool things coming up. That's June 27th. And then the other announcement that I want to make, there are still a few positions that are available for Bible school. So if you haven't um, signed up to volunteer for Bible school, uh, please see Angie. Uh, I know she's not here this morning. She's traveling. Um, but see myself. We can get you involved in that as well. That's coming up very quickly. Inside of the bulletin, um, we are in a new month. Uh, so that means there's new Operation Christmas Child items to collect. Um, That list is inside of the bulletin. Uh, Still, if you are wanting to uh, or need a card sent to someone, please contact Kathy. Uh, The next book club is coming up on June 1st. That'll be at Miss Denise's house. So, Denise, right there. Uh, Yeah, that'll be at uh, Denise's home. Um, And I think Mark's cooking all the food that night, right? Yeah, you're good? Okay. 
So we'll, we'll have that next one on June 1st. And then the water balloon count, we're a third of the way there. 5,000 water balloons. We just need 10,000 more. So not that many left to go. Uh, so please bring those in um, and put those in the back, and then we'll continue to update that count. Um, I believe that is most of the announcements. Are there any other announcements that I missed? Any other announcements? All right. Well, what about praises or prayer requests? Yeah, Paul. Wow. Wow. That's a that's a really cool praise. Awesome. Awesome. Great praise. Yeah. Yeah, Tina. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, and we'll remember that family in prayer as well. Thank you for that. Any others? Praises or prayer requests? Yeah, Bart. Yeah. Yeah, remember them. Remember them. Yep. Any others? Yeah, Janie. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, if you weren't able to catch that, Alex, uh, one of our own here graduated yesterday from NKU. So uh, my alma mater as well. So I uh, extend congratulations. Awesome. Any others? Yeah. Praises or prayer requests? Yeah. Yeah. Remember that family. Such a, a tragic loss there. I know many of us are following. So remember that family. Any others? Yeah, I remember her. Yeah, I remember her. That was, that was awesome to see. I saw some pictures as well. Um, another praise that I want to give, and uh, don't want to put anybody on the spot, but I just want to thank uh, Jackie for this week. I had an opportunity to come here for National Day of Prayer. Uh, just a really cool event. So uh, hopefully if you weren't able to join us here, you took a moment, prayed for our country, prayed for uh, your specific prayer request. You know, there was no agenda behind it, uh, but I was able to come between the five to seven hours. I think we had quite a few people show up uh, of a morning and just thankful for, for Jackie and, and Gary setting that up and just having the church open. The church was wide open for anybody that wanted to come and pray. So thankful for that opportunity. Uh, but that that's two things for us. One, we can always do that. You know, if you ever want to get into the church and pray, let us know. I think it challenges us as a church to do this more. Uh, but then, too, that it gives us an opportunity to know that we are built on prayer. It is our foundation and it is what we're called to do. So just thank you for that. And that was an awesome praise to celebrate that. Yeah. Any others? Yeah, Barb. Yeah, remember them. Remember them. Yeah. Any others? All right. Well, if not, uh, once again, just want to praise uh, today in celebration of our mothers and women in the room. So thank you for that. Um, we're excited today to finish our uh, study in Esther, uh, who is another woman that we've uh, we've been celebrating over the past few weeks and her courage for the Lord as well. But we'll be there here in just a few moments. Um, so let's go to the Lord now in prayer. Father, we come to you and we just thank you for this day. Lord, as we celebrate our, our women, we celebrate the, the mothers in the room. Father, we just lift them to you now. We know that the, the role of a mother is an important one. Uh, Father, we know that as, as women today that we, we have significant responsibilities uh, before us as men, but Lord, as a, as a woman, it is a special, special role. And Father, we just thank them for all they do today. Lord, we celebrate them. And Father, we just ask that you would bless them today, and not only today, but every day, Lord. So let us just uh, take a moment and reflect on all that they've done in our lives and the significant women that are in our lives. So Father, just be with them now. And Lord, just remember the prayer requests that were mentioned those that are sick, those that are, Lord, going through trials, those that may be facing uh, different types of persecution, Lord, we just ask that you give them your comforting hand, Lord, your healing hand, if it would be your will. And we just thank you for many praises, Lord, the events that are going on here. Father, we have a, 
a packed agenda. We have many offerings for all ages, all uh, different uh, different types of people, Lord, different backgrounds. We're just so thankful for the many offerings that we have here. So, Lord, just bless those ministries, bless women's ministry, men's ministry, our youth ministry. Lord, all the different things that we're doing here, Lord, we're just so thankful that you would bless it and that you would just allow us to do your kingdom work. So, Father, be with us through the remainder of the service as we sing, as we tune to your scripture. And, Lord, here in just a moment as we finish our series in Esther, we ask it all in your sins and we pray. Amen. Let's all stand for our next hymn this morning. When upon life's pillows you are tempest tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Good morning, everybody. Okay, I am here today. Never thought I would do anything like this. <laughs> Just going to tell you my truth up front. And I think that's what God wants from me today, is to give you my truth. I think if you can hear somebody else's truth and how they got to where they are, maybe it can help you get to your truth, which is truth to power, as we're learning right now. So I want to tell you a little bit about myself. I was not raised in any kind of religion whatsoever. My dad's a wonderful man, but he doesn't believe in God. And when he first, when I was a kid, we first had this conversation. I'm like, what's God, Dad? I hear people talking, you know. He's like, I can't really explain it to you. I don't believe in it, but I want you to make your own informed decisions. And when he said he didn't believe in God, that, that scared me. Why? I didn't have God or religion in me. I didn't know anything about it. Where did that come from? So I, I want every one of you to think about how I've gotten here in life, how I got to this point. We all ask ourselves, how did we get here? So I want you, hopefully through my truth, 
you can come to your truth of how you got in any situation. We come to so many different situations, politics, money, religion, life. How do we get here, you know? And when I think of that, I think of when you always talk about the egg and the chicken, okay? Which came first? Sometimes we are not just supposed to see. Sometimes we just have to understand. Look at common sense. Look at people around you. Generally, when you're seeing groups of people, most of them are on the right track. So pay attention to that, you know. Don't lose that. Don't, you know. And I'm nervous, so <laughs> I'm trying to listen to God because I didn't write anything down. I wanted to talk from my heart. So as I come through life, I have lots of bumps, lots of pains. <laughs> and I come to a point in my life, I was weary. I believed in God, but I was missing something. I thought I was doing everything right. I thought I was trying to be kind good to people. Of course, I sin and I lie. I, I, you know, we've all. So I come to terms that um, some people say, I think maybe for my dad, I, don't, I can't see God. You know, sometimes you just have to believe not to see. And so Again, this is from my heart. I want you to take away today, and hopefully you'll find peace and love and kindness, which is all God wants from us. Sometimes I think we put so much into it. I know my mind goes a million miles an hour, and I put so much into something sometimes, and it's just, I was missing it. It was all right under my nose. It was all right there. Like Shelly said when she did her scripture, when you're having problems, go to the Bible. The answer are in there. They really, really are. You may not think so. If you have to do it by your phone, then go to your phone and ask it. And ask for something to give you peace. This is what I've gotten from religion. And it's all new and exciting and for someone to like my dad that doesn't believe I want him to see what that for me maybe what that might feel like so he sees me happy now after seeing me the past three years going through government <laughs> the laws and really struggling I hope that I can be infectious to someone else and they can pass that along. So for my dad, I always worried if he didn't believe, he, he wouldn't go to heaven. And that's scary when you think maybe one of your family members maybe not won't meet you there. So I want to read today. We are here in the flesh, but we can be here spiritually too. And we have to live in this world, in politics especially, in the flesh. But try to live there spiritually too. It will help balance you. It will make those pains lightened. They're going to be there, but it lightens them. Um, and... If we send our, our family members that we love so much over to seas, why do we do that? If, if we don't believe, if we don't fight for our nation, why, what's it all, what's the point? So we have to believe in something, ourselves and what God gave us, our instincts. 
to tell the truth, to give your truth to yourself, God, or I'm trying to give it to you, so maybe I can help somebody else. And in the end, no matter when that end may be, I hope and pray for everybody they have found peace by then to just live in their own skin while they're here. And then I extremely hope and pray they've found spiritual so they can go on to live for eternity and happy. I have lots of things marked, but I went with what he told me, and so. You, this is uh, Galatians 5.13 through 26, and it's life by the Spirit. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. Do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbors as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will destroy each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the spirit was contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you do not, whatever you want. If you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of flesh are obviously sexual, immorality, impurity, debauchery, Idol tree, which is hard for a lot of people. That's a lot of things in the flesh and in our hands. It's anything we put before God and our families. Money, politics, everything. And witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish <laughs> ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, those who live in this will not inherit the kingdom. I want to stop right there. So that, to me, here in the flesh, feels like you won't, you're not going to inherit happiness. You're going to keep feeling that pain. You're going to be at, at that weary point, at that bottom. You're not going to feel it if you're living in the flesh all the time. But the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And against things, there is no law. Those who belong to Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus, sorry, have crucified the flesh with its passion and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become deceited, provoking, and envying each other. And I've, that's what I believe we just need to try and remember every day. If you do something in the flesh and you know it's wrong, try, just try to make a spiritual moment with it and make it right. And see where you're at. I know that's what's getting me through a lot and everything because the world's hard. It's, it's knotted. It's complicated. <laughs> but I know I want peace and happiness. And when I see sadness on other people's faces, then I know what I look like. So, again, in the end, when your time comes, Corinthians 15:55 Where O death 
is your victory. Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting is where we're living in the flesh. Victory is where we live in our hearts with God. Thank you. Can you pray for me, Donnie?
Well, good morning once again, and this is it. This is the, the final uh, countdown when it comes to Esther. But first, before we hop in today, I just want to give a huge thank you um, to, to Becky. I know taking the, uh, the, the first step in reading scripture is a tough one, but peace, love, and kindness. Uh, that's what we are to show. I'm so thankful that this church just shows that every time I walk in the door. That's one of the first things I saw about this church um, and their loving hearts. So thank you for, for that, that reminder. Uh, but happy Mother's Day again. And I'm just so thankful today that we get to celebrate all the women in the room. But if you're like me, um, one of the hardest things to do when it comes to Mother's Day is to find that perfect gift. And you've heard many stories of me trying to find gifts for Natalie um, and my mom and different things. Um, but this year, uh, I think I had a, a good, good gift for Natalie. You can ask her about that after service. I won't go into all of that within illustration purposes. But I heard a story once about three sons. They were brothers. Um, that were talking about uh, what they were going to get their mom. They had done well, they had prospered, and their mom was elderly, and they were really trying to get her a very good Mother's Day gift. And they were pretty competitive about this, and they were talking about what they were going to send to their mother. The first son said, well, uh, I know my mom would enjoy a big house, so I bought her a big house, uh, 10,000 square feet, huge house, everything that she wants is in this house, 10,000 square feet. Well, the second son said, well, I think I got you beat. I bought my mom a Mercedes Benz with a driver. The third son said, well, I've got you both beat. I know that our mother is getting a little bit older. Her eyes are getting a little bit worse, and she loves her Bible. So I sent 12 priests to a monastery for a year to have a parrot know how to recite the Bible. They went through this for a long time, and they finally taught this parrot any chapter, any verse she can name, it, and this parrot can read it. It cost me $100,000 in order to get this parrot trained in order to read the Bible. So Mother's Day comes and passes, and the sons are sitting around, and they each receive handwritten letters from their mother. To the first son, she writes, son, I appreciate the house, but I'm so old and I can't get around very well. I can only live in one room, but i got to clean the whole house. The second son gets his letter. He said, son, I appreciate the Mercedes Benz, but I'm too old to travel, and I really don't like to go that fast. So maybe next time you'll do a little bit better job. To the third son, she wrote, she said, son, I'm so thankful for you. Out of all of the three sons, you knew exactly what I would like. That was the best chicken I've ever eaten. <laughs> now, I don't know about you. And I don't know how much money you spent on your mother, but the greatest thing that you can show her today is love. The greatest thing you can show our women in the room today is love and kindness and just give her the time that she deserves. And today, as I mentioned, we not only celebrate mothers, but all women. We've been studying a very important woman in the Bible over the last several weeks by the name of Esther. And today we're going to conclude our series in this book. And we've covered a lot over the past few weeks. I'm going to give you a synopsis today or a recap of what that looks like. Um, but in all of those things that we've considered and all that we've learned, one thing that I've mentioned, and maybe we understand up to this point, is there's one individual that hasn't been directly mentioned within the Scripture, and that is God. The Lord, uh, His name has not been mentioned directly in the book today, and all of our focus as we round this out today is going to be on Him. But let me ask you a question. Anybody here ever play the good childhood game hide-and-seek? Have you ever played hide-and-seek? Okay, everybody's played hide-and-seek. Mark, you ever played hide-and-seek? Okay, okay, well, raise your hand next time. Um, <laughs> but anyways, anyways, <laughs> oh, man. All right, let me try this again. Anybody here ever play hide and seek? All those hands went up fast, went up fast that time. Okay, well, if you know my son, he, <laughs> I can't believe I just said that. Um, if you know my son, he loves to play hide and seek. You know, when we're at home, he always likes to say, go hide. He'll say, go hide, mommy, go hide, daddy. And we'll, we'll play this for as much time as we give to him. And you know, the competitive guy that I am, I want to hide in some tough spots. Now, he's two years old, um, so I'm not going to make it too hard, but I don't want it to be like Natalie, like she'll just sit on the couch and act like she's hiding. I'm like, come on, go, go make it a little bit harder. But anyways, uh, we, like to, we like to play hide and seek, so I'll go and hide, and there's times that I hide so well, <laughs> this is a two-year-old, but I'll hide so well that I'll be sitting there wondering, is he ever going to find me? 
am I going to be in this place for the rest of my life? And I'll just wonder if he's ever going to find me. But he's still looking. You'll hear him, Daddy, Daddy, where are you, Daddy? He'll be running around looking, and then he'll employ Natalie's help, but she's pushing him to find me. So what do I have to do? Every once in a while, you got to make a, a noise, a noise that can't be repeated, that it's a little bit embarrassing for you here at church, or you have to throw something, or you have to, make, you have to knock on the door to make it a little bit more obvious that I'm still there. To make it a little bit more obvious that I'm still willing to be found. To let him know that I'm still um, in the house. I'm still with him. You know, when we look at the book of Esther, and we go throughout all of the scripture today, we understand that God may not be directly mentioned, but he's still there. And if we look, and we don't have to look too hard, he's in obvious places. And as we come to the scripture today, he is hidden all throughout the word. He has shown his hand in everything that we've seen from keeping Esther safe last week to leading up to an entire people group from being saved. And for us, this is still true. There are many times in our lives where we wonder where God is. We think that he's nowhere to be found. We think that just when we think that he's left us, he reminds us that he's still there. At times, God makes himself known So we understand that he's still around. The book of Esther teaches us that we have a God that while we may not directly see him, he is always there. And as we conclude our series today, let me give you a final recap of, you know, what we've seen. And then ultimately we'll point to today how we can celebrate the Lord and all that he's shown us throughout this book. We're introduced today, and I'll keep this quick, to the empire itself. The first thing that we see coming out of Esther is that we're in a pretty tough spot. We're in an empire, the Persian Empire here, that's corrupt, wealthy, ungodly. We're introduced to King Xerxes and Queen Vashti. The, queen tri- or sorry, the king tries to show her off. Um, she, won't, she won't do this. So what happens? She's pushed out of office. And now Queen Esther has taken the spot. Esther, we know, is a Jew. She comes into this beauty pageant of sorts with about 400 women, and she comes to find favor before the king, and she becomes queen. Now, a reminder at this point, and going to be important for us uh, today, um, she leaves out a very important piece of information. She doesn't tell the king that she's a Jew. She doesn't tell the individuals that are there that she's a Jew. And we're also introduced to a key player, and her cousin, also her guardian, in Mordecai. He's her primary caregiver. And what we see coming out of really that first week is at the end of it, Mordecai and Esther are in some, you know, weird spots. Esther's now queen. Uh, she's a Jew. She's not made this known. Mordecai hears that someone's going to kill the king, and he sends this to Esther and really saves the king's life. And then we're introduced to the villain of the story, which is Haman, who has become second in command. And as this is announced, he is infuriated because Mordecai will not bow down before him. So Mordecai refuses to show honor to um, Haman. We don't know exactly why, but within this, Haman learns of it. And he says, I can't have this. I can't have somebody out there that's putting my name down and not bowing before me. So not only am I going to take care of Mordecai, I'm going to take care of all the Jewish people group. So he goes before the king and says, King, uh, we need to destroy, annihilate, and plunder all the goods of the Jews and he offers him $3 billion to do so. Sends out letters to all the provinces about this, and then Mordecai hears of it, he's upset, and he calls out to Esther. And he asks Esther to go before the king, and we remember that she refuses. She knows that she may die. And if you don't remember this verse, it was the climax of the book in chapter 4. Mordecai says this, For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise... For the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. This is where we hit the climax of the story. Esther is enlisted here. She is employed to save a whole people group. Mordecai says, if you won't, somebody will. We see God's providential hand happen at this point. So Esther says what? Okay, if I die, I die. And she goes before the king. And she asks for a favor. And he says, okay, whatever you want, I'll give to you. And she sits down before the king and Haman, not only once, but twice in a feast here. And she reveals Haman's plot. And everything turns upside down for Haman very, very quickly. He wanted to kill the Jews. He wanted to kill Mordecai. And now he's going to die. And he's hung on the gallows of where he had positioned 
Mordecai to be. And then we get to the end of last week, where all of Haman's namesake and assets have been given to Esther and Mordecai, and a letter's been sent out. The king asked what Esther wants, you know, in kind of the ending circumstances here. She said, well, you know what, you've saved us, you've saved Mordecai, but that's not all. We need to save all of the Jews. So the king says, okay, well, send out a letter, let's try to stop this. So they send out the letter in the name of the king here, and we come to today. The point where the Jews are now facing the armies and are called to defend themselves. We're at the final scene. We're at the final piece of the movie. And today I want to focus on the story through the lens of the real hero. And the real hero of this story is not Esther. It's not Mordecai. It's not the Jews. It's the Lord. The hero of the story all along has never been any of these key characters that we've talked about, but it's been the Lord. Through all of this and all of his workings comes down to right here. So each of the applications that I'll give you today will reflect on the providence in our lives. So if you're with me, let's start in chapter, in chapter 9, verse 1. I just want to read a few verses here, and then I want to tell you what we can take away from the Lord in our lives. Now, on the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar, on the thirteenth day of the same, when the king's command and edicts were about to be carried out, on the very day when the enemies of the Jews hoped to gain the mastery over them, the reverse occurred. This is important. This is important, and I won't spend a lot of time here, but it's very important for us. This is the day that Haman had asked all of the Jews to be killed. This is where it's going to happen, but it's important that the Bible points out the reversal actually occurs, that this isn't actually going to happen. So the Jews actually gained mastery over those who hated them. The Jews gathered in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Xerxes to lay hands on those who sought their harm. And no one could stand against them, for the fear of them had fallen on all peoples. All of the officials of the provinces and the satraps and the governors and the royal agents also helped the Jews, for the fear of Mordecai had fallen on them. For Mordecai was great in the king's house, and his fame spread throughout all the provinces, for the man Mordecai grew more and more powerful. The Jews struck all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them, and did as they pleased to those who hated them. In Susa, remember the primary territory here, the citadel itself, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men. Skip on to verse 16. Now the rest of the Jews who were in the king's provinces also gathered to defend their lives and got relief from their enemies and killed 75,000 of those who hated them, but they laid no hands on the plunder. If you're taking notes today, the first thing that I want us to consider is may the Lord find us faithful where others have failed. This is a challenge for you, it's a challenge for me, and it's a challenge for our church that the Lord would find us faithful. This should be our challenge in our heart's sake where others have failed. Anyone here ever inherit a mess? Anybody here ever inherit a mess? Okay, a few of you. Okay, a few of you. Not as many people as played hide and seek, but a few of you have inherited a mess. Now, when you think of inheritance, um, what does that typically mean? It's not always what we expect. It's not always what we expect. I read in the, the news this week, just very quickly, about a dog that actually inherited. The family was kind of torn up about who was going to get the money. So what did the individual do that was giving away the estate? He gave the dog $12 million. Now, I would be a little upset about that. So that family kind of inherited a mess. But we come to this part of the story where this generation of Jews, this generation in the Persian Empire, has inherited somewhat of a mess. And they're here to clean up Haman's mess, to really clean up what he's done. And it even goes back before him. Previous generations here, if Haman was truly of this bloodline that we know and linked back to this family, the Jews had an opportunity here to do something that previous generations could not. And they weren't going to pass the problem to anyone else. As you know, we've had enough of this. We've had enough of this pushback. We've had enough of this, this trials, this tribulation against us. We are going to stand up for ourselves. The Lord is faithful here where others have failed. And to point to this, I think the Lord wants us to consider a few things. Just in these specific verses, I think we need to consider a few things. First, consider the reversal. Haman's plan did not come to fruition. Haman wanted to kill a people group. He wanted to kill all the Jews, take all of their stuff. But in fact, the opposite happens. Really, his plan blows up in front of him, and now his whole family, 
is going to die or has died at this point. We see that the reversal here is through the Lord being faithful to the people that are showing their will towards Him. It points me to one of my favorite verses. Romans 8, Clark was talking about this this morning. We didn't make it this far, but verse 28 says this, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to His own purpose. We see this truth proclaimed over and over in God's Word. We see it in our own lives in Christ's death, and resurrection. The people here are doing what they were called to do. They're taking the command of Mordecai, of Esther, and they're not going to allow another generation to fail. But the problem with me, the problem with us, the problem with us as humans is that when we look at a verse like Romans 8, verse 28 here, we have to constantly remind ourselves of this. We see all of the evil in this world. We see all the things that are going on around us, but we fail to understand that God is still working. If we would have stopped reading in the book of Esther, where Haman and the king worked out their deal, we would have thought that he was going to let his people down. We would have thought that he was just going to let a whole generation of people, a whole group of people die. The people thought that they were going to take down the Jews, but God, what did he do? He united and strengthened his people. When one Jew steps out to fight, they all did. When one Jew went to the battlefield, they all did. Don't miss this truth for us. As a church, we have to do the same. As a church today, Esther is challenging us on two accords here. One, that we have to be united. Let's not get divided over the small secondary things of this world. Let's not get divided over the small secondary things that life is going to throw to us. But let us carry on the traditions, one of previous generations... But on top of that, build on what they've done and do things that maybe they couldn't do. You know, let me share a scary statistic with you. I mentioned this last night. I posted it on Facebook if you didn't see this. If you haven't heard this, 7 out of 10, 7 out of 10 unchurched people, when I say unchurched people, individuals that have never walked into a church, individuals that have never been in a church, 7 out of 10 of them never get a single invite to church in their whole life. In their whole life, they are never asked to join someone in service. And we ask the question, why? Now, this is the statistic that scares me. This is for all of us. Because 98% of churchgoers never extend a single invite to someone else in their entire life. Yet, of the 70% that never received the invite, 86% of them said they would actually come. Before we can do work for the Lord, we have to stand united. We can't do it from one person or from another or one group without a whole. As a church, we can grow and we can move and we can do the kingdom work, but we have to be united just like the Jews were here and standing before Haman and standing before their enemies. And we understand that God will work. He will be faithful to those that will do work for him. But second, consider their restraint. Biblical authors don't repeat themselves because they forgot what they wrote. I love this. Items are repeated in Scripture because of their importance. Three times, three times in just this chapter, in, in chapter 9, the author tells us that the Jews had the opportunity to plunder the goods of those that they destroyed. But you know what they didn't do? They never took them. They never took them. Remember, if the Jews would have fallen, what did Haman say to do? to destroy them, to annihilate them, to kill them, and to take all of their possessions. The Jews had the exact same opportunity when they're fighting back, but as they destroy their enemies, they never take their goods. You ask why? Because the intent, their motive, their reasoning behind this was never about economy or about social status or about money. It was all about preservation of their people group. Had they lost, the exact opposite would have happened to them. But they had a genuine motive behind what they were doing. As Christ followers today, when we are authentic, genuine Christ followers, it is never about, don't miss this, it is never about what we get out of it. It is never about that. It is always about being for someone else. Today, our church is called to reach those that are in need. And, and don't, don't think that I'm saying that you won't experience great joy, because you will. I'm sure all the women is. It was mentioned earlier, yesterday, had a great time. 
and you threw them all in a room together, they had a lot of joy come out of it. They had a lot of fun. But when our primary goal today becomes more about the temporary than the eternal, our motives are not right. We have to consider their restraint. And we as Christ followers have to restrain our minds and our hearts from this thought process, just like the Jews did here. But let's continue on. The Jews are coming out of battle here as we're closing out the book. It says, this was on the 13th day of the month of Adar, and on the 14th day they rested. And they made that day of feasting and gladness. Go on to verse 20. And Mordecai recorded these things and sent letters to all the Jews who were in the provinces of King Xerxes, both near and far, obliging them to keep the 14th day of the month and also the 15th day of the same year by year, as the days on which the Jews got relief from their enemies and as the month that had been turned for them from sorrow into gladness and from mourning into a holiday, that they should make them days of feasting and gladness, days for sending gifts of food to one another and gifts to the poor. Now, when we get to this feast here and its inauguration as a day to remember the Lord's faithfulness, this really gives us our next understanding of God. Take this down. May we celebrate the Lord's deliverance in our lives and never forget its power. We are called to celebrate the Lord's deliverance in our lives and never forget its power. It's one thing for you to be a one time thanker. Hopefully, that's not you. You throw that real quick, hey, thank you, but then just walk away from it. It's another thing to continue to remember why you thank them to begin with. In this moment, the Jews are setting up a mechanism that allows them to continually thank God for all that he's done for them. They set up a day of reflection to where they can never forget. And for us as individuals, Esther teaches us the Lord has blessed us with much. The Lord has blessed each and every one of us with a roof over our head, with food to eat, with ministry that we can come freely and we can come and be with each other. And we should thank him for that. The Jews just came out of a war zone. They just came out of a time that was going to be one of the hardest times in their lives. And they had trust that the Lord would continue to bring them through. The challenge becomes for us today when we look at the book of Esther, what have we set up in our lives to thank and celebrate God frequently? Yes, we have service every Sunday, and that's important. It's important that we come here. And I think it's important. Don't miss this. One of my favorite parts of service is when we do praises and prayer requests. I love to hear your praise. I love to hear you publicly thanking God for all that he's done in your life. But in your individual life today, let me ask you this. Are you celebrating and never forgetting what the Lord has done for you? in the gift of salvation, and the gift of everything that you have here, but most importantly for the eternal gift that he has promised us. Have we set up a moment of thanksgiving for him? But let's finish out our our time in Esther by looking at the final verses here. We'll finish chapter 9, and there's just a few verses here in chapter 10. It says, Then Queen Esther, she really finishes us off here, the daughter of Abel and Mordecai the Jew gave full written authority confirming this second letter about Purim. Letters were sent to all the Jews through the 127 promises of the kingdom of Xerxes in words of peace and truth. That these days of Purim should be observed at their appointed season as Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther obligated them. And as they had obligated themselves and their offspring with regards to their fast and their lamenting, the command of Esther confirmed these practices of Purim and it was recorded in writing. And then finally, chapter 10 as we finish the book. King Xerxes imposed tax on the land and on the coastlands of the sea, and all the acts of his power and might, and the full account of the high honor of Mordecai, to which the king advanced him, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles to the king of Media and Persia? For Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Xerxes, and he was great amongst the Jews and popular with the multitude of his brothers, for he sought the welfare of the people, of his people, and spoke peace to all his people. So the queen reinforces this command, and we see a major change for Mordecai. Now there's, you know, we we hear the old saying how the tables have turned. Literally at this point, Mordecai is now second in command. And I think for Esther and for Mordecai today, as we close this book, they teach us two things. Let me close the book with this. Let me close this series with these two things. First, may we be faithful stewards of all God entrusts to us. Take these things away with you when we look at the book of Esther. At the beginning of the book, just as a reminder, we didn't know much about Esther and Mordecai. 
When we meet them, all we know about is the empire that they're a part of. And we see their compromises. We see their identification or lack thereof. The compromise of their people group and not wanting to tell people of their heritage. Not wanting to tell people that they're Jewish. But as the story progresses, as we go week over week, so did their understanding of what God had entrusted them with. We really see a spiritual maturity of Esther and Mordecai over several weeks, over several chapters. It wasn't just for their sake, but for all of those that are in the empire. And here at the end of the book, we see it all recorded. This is the same for us. I don't know what your story is. I don't know what your story was before coming to know Christ. And today, if you don't know him and you haven't taken that step, I don't know. But let me tell you this. It doesn't matter. There is no sin. There is no gap in your life. There is no thing that you have done that is too big for God. If we miss that in the teaching of Esther, if we miss the Lord's grace and His providential hand in all of our lives, we've missed the purpose of the gospel. But when you come, and hopefully you would take this step, when you come to follow Him, He entrusts us with something far greater than anything we have on this earth. And that is the gift of salvation. But also to witness for Him. And we're to be faithful to that. So Esther challenges us today. It's not just about us. It's not just about me. It's not just about you. It's not just about Persimmon Grove. But it is about those 70% of individuals out there that have never seen the church door. God entrusts us with that witness. God entrusts each and every one of us that we would take that word into the world and invite those individuals to hear about him. Esther could have stopped. Mordecai could have stopped when they were saved and said, okay, let's enjoy the riches of this world. But they knew that there was something far greater than that, and that was to save the Jews. Today, we could just stop, but God has entrusted us with far more than that. And finally, the last point, the final point of the book of Esther today. Let me give you one more point in our study. May we always remember that God is the real hero. We've come a long way in five weeks. I've really enjoyed Esther. I've really, really enjoyed teaching on Esther. And we've come a long way in five weeks, and a lot has happened. A lot changed for Esther. A lot has changed for Mordecai. A lot changed for all the characters. But you know who never changed? God. In the midst of their circumstances, in the midst of their suffering, in the midst of the Jews wondering, remember, they received the letter, who is going to save us? Who is going to save me? God was working in the background. God was working in the sleeping. He was working in the daytime. He was working at all times. God worked his perfect plan through imperfect people. And he is still doing that today. God is the hero in your life. And he is waiting to use people just like you to carry his word into the world. Esther was a normal individual. She came from not much, became the queen, but never forgot her heritage. She may have concealed it for a bit, but we see the challenge that was put before her. Today, the Lord, I believe, in your life is challenging you to do something. Every one of you has someone on your heart. Think about that for just a moment before we close. Every one of you, think about someone that needs to hear the gospel. Someone that you know that hasn't been invited to church or maybe doesn't go to church or hasn't received the word of Christ. All of us have that person. All of us have that opportunity to take that word to them. But more importantly than that, maybe that's you. If you haven't accepted the Lord into your life, if you haven't accepted him into a relationship with you, let us always remember that he's never changed, that he is the true hero, and that in our lives, he will be there to forgive us of our shortcomings and will be there to forgive us of all that we have to bring to him. So let Esther remind us today as we close that God is the real hero in your life. He is never changing and he is always there. Let's pray. Fathers, we close our study today, Lord, as we've been throughout Esther, as we've taken this this moment over the past several weeks to reflect on her life and her ministry and the multiple character changes and the multiple things that happen within the book. Father, we're just reminded, although you're not directly mentioned here, Lord, you're all over the pages. 
And Father, there may be someone here today that's struggling, wondering where you are or what your plan is or what your call is on their life. Lord, just reveal that to them. Father, just remind them that you're there. But Lord, more importantly, let us seek you out. And if there's someone here today that hasn't taken that step, Lord, that they would make that step, that they would enter into that relationship with you, Lord, and give you all the honor and all the glory. And Father, let us never forget that you are the true hero in our lives. You are the true gift in our lives, Lord, and the only way to eternity is through you. So Father, today as we close this book, let us reflect on our own lives, let us reflect on our own ministry, Lord, that we would take your word into a world that desperately needs it. And Father, that if we haven't received that ourselves, that we would do so now. Lord, we ask it all in your son's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand for our hymn of invitation. Once again, I can't say it enough, happy Mother's Day to all the females in the room. Uh, just a reminder uh, for the guys in the room, take care of your females, not only today, but every day. So uh, just, uh, just a reminder for each and every one of us, we're thankful for you. Um, and, and thank you for those that helped participate yesterday and for Melissa putting that together um, as well. And then upcoming this week, no evening service tonight. Uh, just a reminder, Wednesday night, 6.30. And then next week, we'll have food uh, following service. If you want to talk with, uh, with Don and, and check in on him and how everything's going with Haiti as our partnership continues to grow there. While we're not physically there as we would want to be right now, we continue to, to partner uh, very closely with him. So we're excited for that next week as well. Any other announcements that I may have missed? All right. Well, if not, Clark, would you close in prayer?